Well, let me first just say welcome. I'm just delighted that we're together, and I am just feasting, looking at all of your faces, and so aware of the creativity of God that has fashioned each of us, the variety of God's um, imagination, the way that we've been knit together in our mother's wombs, formed and shaped over the years by our experiences. We're a room of people who have great differences and deep similarities. We're a group that that is alike and then completely not alike. And uh, all of that is exactly the kind of chemistry that I think the New Testament talks about as this unique new thing called the body of Christ, the new humanity, this unexpected communion of people, often unlike one another, who find each other because of Jesus Christ. And it's really in that spirit that we're here, and it's in that spirit that I think we are carrying out our ministries, and it's certainly in that spirit that this process of rethinking church has been undertaken. I know that some of you don't know much about Fuller. I, I only want to say a bit, just so that you know where you are and, and how this fits into the larger landscape. So Fuller was founded 75 years ago, it was founded by an, a, television, a radio evangelist um, who had the biggest radio program in America. 10 million people a week listened to his radio program called the Old Fashioned Revival Hour. He was one founder. He was a businessman. He lived here in Pasadena. And then he, the second founder was a man named Harold Ockengay, who was the pastor of Park Street Church in Boston, who was much more a kind of classic, academically oriented scholar. They came together to form a seminary that they felt was really needed on the West Coast. That was a, a seminary that was neither uh, given to what was seen at that time to be either liberal or fundamentalistic orientations, but to actually somehow hold on to the deep orientation of the gospel in the context of culture at a time when the good news is needed not only in the United States, but, but around the world. So it was a very uh, flourishing time. Fuller uh, has had a wonderful history. It also has a distinctive at one time of having three schools. Now we just have two, but the same three disciplines, theology, intercultural studies, and psychology. So the weaving together of those three things for these most of these 75 years has really been one of the unique brands of Fuller in the sense that it, it puts together what, at the time that Fuller was started and when the schools began, were not things that were easily knit together. Fuller's also had the great joy and privilege of welcoming people from uh, hundreds of countries around the world. Typically, our student body has had in excess of 100 nations represented within it at any given time. And that has meant that Fuller's also had a view far beyond uh, the shores of the United States, and many, many students who have come here and other students who have then, of course, returned. Now, because we have so many students that are also online, there's students scattered really all over the globe uh, and all over the United States. This is a project within all of that enterprise. I have just stepped down as the president after a decade and later, you'll have an opportunity to meet my successor, who is David Emanuel Goatley over here, who is just a, a tremendous gift to Fuller. I couldn't be happier that he's the, the person that's now president of Fuller. And you'll hear and see in this, I think, some of the flavor of what it is that we've been up to and where, in part, we, and by that I mean not just Fuller, but we, the body of Christ, gathered here, uh, mm -hmm. are, are aiming to go. It was probably uh, five or six years ago um, that I particularly began to feel a great anxiety. I'd seen and experienced as a pastor for 30 years the experience of the faithfulness and love of God that meets congregations. I love congregational ministry. I love being in the trenches in ministry in all seasons of life and in all kinds of contexts. I mostly spent my pastoral ministry in Berkeley, California, which is uh, one of the more bizarre places to be a pastor, and and also one of the most wonderful places to be a, a pastor, precisely because it is, after all, so unusual. Um, so it, it was a place that gave me um, a deeper understanding of the gospel. I had not grown up in a Christian home. I came to faith as a college student. I stumbled my way into seminary with no intention of being a pastor, and becoming a pastor, and then God, in his mercy, uh, has given me great gifts of opportunities to be in places to serve. So here's the, here's the thing. It was five or six years ago that we were already long seeing some of the, both the benefits and glories of what God is doing in churches and represented in your churches and in the ones that I have been associated with too. But we were also, I think, increasingly aware, I was deeply aware of the fact that the church showed fracture lines 
race, fractured lines of economics, fractured lines of culture, fractured lines of theology, fractured lines of ethics, and, and on and on and on the list goes. Lots and lots of fracture lines. And in the context of that, the question that was in my mind was, what is this that's happening and what's behind what's happening? Then, then those were the easier times. You could just saw fracture lines. Frankly, being from California, you're used to seeing lots of fracture lines because that's what it means to live on the West Coast in an earthquake zone. Um, but in this case, it was then like, like a whole bunch of brush got piled on and then a whole lot of gasoline got thrown on and then a lot of fires got lit. And now we didn't have just the evidence of growth and change and even division, but now we had hostility and heat and flames and burning uh, that was profound and exposed in our nation and in the church in our nation, all kinds of things that were already there. It's not like many of these things were, were not there. It's just that they became more and more evident, and they were plainly evident. Now, American history has had periods when the, the nature of the church's health has risen and the times in the church when the church has, has really not only stammered in its life, but had a great struggle and pain. We have succeeded and we have deeply failed. I could go on and on about that in my own personal experience, but the thing that I want to say about this project is let's gather together within Fuller a group of people who would devote themselves for a period of time to simply ask the big questions. What is it that's going on? How might we think about the whole enterprise of church in America? What are we seeing? What are we not seeing? And then what is behind the concerns that are being raised? And then what's behind those concerns that are being raised? And then what's behind those concerns that are being raised? Because what does a theological seminary like Fuller exist for, except to try to be the kind of catalytic educational institution in which people can come from all sorts of backgrounds and circumstances to actually ask the question of what is God doing in me and through us, and how might we together collectively contribute to the work of God in the church uh, and the body of Jesus Christ in all of its varied and diverse manifestations across the nation and uh, potentially in so many places around the world as well. It was not a vision of grandiosity. It wasn't putting Fuller at the center of the church crisis, saying Fuller needs to crack the nut of what church in the 21st century should look like. It was simply saying, what is our enterprise about? And if in the, t in the sum, if our enterprise isn't contributing to the health and well-being, the, the genuine thriving, the genuine development of the fruit of the Spirit, the genuine evidence of, of a God of love and justice and mercy, then, then what are we actually doing as an institution? So it was really because of that that we gathered, and there are three expressions. There's an expression that has brought this uh, event together, which has happened within Fuller, and Scott referred to that group. Uh, that was a group of faculty and staff and administrators and <clears throat> different people who, who have gathered over the last two years to be working on this. But then there were two additional groups. One is a national group of people completely outside Fuller, about 20, 25 people, all different, you know, an array like this of people from uh, so many different places around the country, uh, different sized churches, different denominations, lots of racial and ethnic diversity. All of that is true of that, of the national group. And then there's another group, which is an international group, about 20 to 25 countries represented, uh, all different places around the globe. For us to have a meeting, it means I get up at four o'clock in the morning in order to get on a Zoom call so that we can actually include all the time zones that are uh, in that group. Each of these groups have been working independently, and a lot of differences exist. But what's been much more profound is the commonality across this array. It's a commonality around certain crises that exist as faith intersects culture in the 21st century. And whether you're in the United States or whether you're in um, Pakistan, or whether you're in uh, Cambodia, or whether you're in uh, Singapore, or whether you're in Indonesia, or Philippines, or whether you're in Europe, or whether you're in Kenya, or, or in Ethiopia, and on and on it goes, we are sharing a lot of common questions while we also have a lot of distinct uh, elements. It's all, in the end, about context. So, Tonight, I'm, uh, I've been given the first of, uh, of, the, of, of the five kind of values, affirmations, commitments that, uh, that we've emerged with in our study and reflection. Um, 
this is the one that I'm going to be referring to tonight about holistic formation. And I'd like to just pray. Lord, you know, in a certain way, what we're, what we're, enter, what we're giving ourselves to in our work day by day and what brings us together is all because of you. It, it all is all because of you. You have created us. You've made us. You've fashioned us. You've nurtured us. You've tended us. You've challenged and rebuked us. You have forgiven us. You've grown us. And tonight, as we think about um, what holistic formation means, we think about our responsibilities. We think about the church that is our responsibility for those gathered here and from various congregational and ministry settings. And as we think about uh, the, the co-laboring work that we could do in these two days, just to think deeply about these five elements that we think are so important. Do a work that's much deeper than, um, than any one person could orchestrate or deeper than could be demonstrated or labeled in an easy way. You're never the God of the easy way. You just are not the God of the easy way. And you are never a God that is about being popular. And you're not a God of glamour. And you're not a God given to superficial fame. And you're not a God of fantasy and idealism. And you're not a God of division. And you're not a God of subversive character. And you're, you're not a God like that. So because you are the God you are, we pray that tonight as we think about holistic formation for a few moments, that we will, we will be stirred to think again about what that means in our own locale our own location, and to hear your voice amidst uh, all else that might be happening in Jesus' name. Amen. All of us are here tonight because we have been formed. We've been formed one way or another from the moment we were born, uh, formed by the God who, uh, who knitted us together in our mother's womb all the way through to this very moment when we arrived in this place. And as we sit in a room like this, as people just introduce themselves, and you settle into your chair, and you're in Southern California and not in some other weather or time zone, and as you think about your denomination isn't like those denominations, and those people are, don't necessarily share the same attitudes about certain things that I think I might share, and they don't come from the same social location that I do, and they may be ethnically or racially different from me, and they have different roles of leadership, there's just this incredible sense that we have all been both similarly formed, but also completely differently formed. I was sitting in, on the plane coming down today from Oakland, where my wife and I now live, and, and as I was doing that, I was just noticing the people that were around me. And I was doing the same thing early tonight when I just arrived, beginning, beginning to look across the room. There's things that we've just shared that are just kind of superficial tags in a way that sort of give us a, a little bit of framing, with some names of cities and churches and congregations, and a little bit of the distinctive, perhaps. But but really, if we were to settle in, if we were to settle in for the long haul, if we were to lock the doors and say, you know what, it's not two days. <laughs> <laughs> you thought it was two days. It just turns out the Lily Endowment has a lot of money. And we are keeping you here for two years. Now suddenly, the landscape of what it actually really would be to be ourselves a deeply formed community, it would take at least two years for us to be able to feel as though we'd hit some sort of bedrock. The privilege of congregational ministry is the unbelievable privilege of getting to accompany a community of people in all of their particularity of formation however healthy or tragic, however joyful and beautiful and life-giving, or however distorted and painful and wrenching it may have been, or all of that all tied together, that is an amazing privilege to look out at a community of people that we have the opportunity together in various roles to see their faces and to have the privilege of walking alongside and into their lives on a sustained basis, for what purpose? Among the purposes, we're highlighting five, is holistic formation. God is never a God of only the part. 
That just isn't how God is. God's being is inclusive. God's being is a being that is never partialized. It's not just a piece of God being interested in a piece of you or a piece of me or a piece of any one person in our congregations. God is a God who holds the whole, right? This is by the language of Colossians in that wonderful Christological hymn, the God who who holds all things together. That's the God that is wanting to do the formation work in our in our lives. And he's not just trying to, therefore, do a superficial work, like let's get people's rear ends in chairs or pews or on the floor in some church setting. Like That is just not God's objective. Those are tools. That's a way of gathering people. That's the kind of thing that we often do. We often like sitting in chairs and being in common places like that. But it just turns out that God is really fundamentally about a deep formation and reformation. We affirm that God is our creator, but then we know that the gospel comes as God's primary evidence that we require transformation, that our our lives are a mess in various ways. And it's because of the deep transformation of the gospel that we are meant to be recreated in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And the trajectory we're on for every person and every community that we are leading and guiding and participating in, we get the opportunity to accompany people in this deep, sacred, holy work of people as flesh and as dust as you and I are, to actually be people that are being conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, we live in a culture that's also absolutely committed to transformation. And we know that because companies like Google exist, and Meta exist, and Facebook exist. And on and on and on and on and on, those kinds of companies and many other forces of influence in our culture are actually trying to also form us. It's all happening at the same time. And in terms of screen time, there's no doubt who gets more screen time, who gets actually locked in and ready. It is our social media world, it is our digital world, it is our public world, it is our work world, it is our social reality. Those are the things that are really primary. And yet, as has always been the case, God, in the quietness and gentleness and persistence of the Holy Spirit, is deeply at work doing an invisible thing. I'm right now working on a, on a book of metaphors about trying to reawaken a Christian imagination. And the metaphor that I'm working on right now is the metaphor of yeast, about the power of God that is seen as invisible, and undistinguishable, once it's kneaded into the, the flower, no distinct character, it's there, and ultimately it will transform everything. But it is a slow and invisible and completely underrated reality. The work of the church, in part, it's not the only image Jesus uses, but among the image Jesus uses is that we're yeast. But the church has presented itself as a public competitor or wanting to be a public competitor, wanting to be an institutional frame that shows itself in a public space as just as good as as any other institution with pyrotechnics and technology and money and resources in place and buildings and histories and narratives. But the actual work, the work of transformation that you and I are called to is a work much more like yeast. It's about letting the yeast of the gospel be in us, but then it's about how we are meant to be yeast among a community of people who, in a fermentation that we can't really measure or exactly calibrate, but we know enough about to contribute to, which is what the amazing, and I do not have the skill of bread making, so I'm not a a personal expert in yeast, but I am the wonderful beneficiary of yeast. (laughs) So the yeast. So what is the work of holistic formation? It's first acknowledging that God is about the whole and about the part. So God is about the whole and about the part. The whole means, at the very least, let's just start saying the, the whole personally and then the whole socially. I want to talk about this in two different dimensions. First, holistic formation personally. Personally, it means how does that how does that work of transformation that Paul writes about 
in Romans 12, I beg you, my brothers and sisters, as an act of intelligent worship, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. It's that work of transformation that actually requires the gospel, and it requires the cross, and it requires an understanding that it involves death. That's the kind of good news that we have. It's grounded in a completely counterintuitive place, in a completely counterintuitive set of actions and in the image of yeast, in, in unseen means, God is doing a work of transformation. And the hope of this gathering, the hope of Fuller Seminary, the hope of the church in the world, is that God has absolutely no intention to ever give that up. And he is working it out. So we are pausing in this little moment in time, in our little geography, wherever that might be, to try to ask, what does holistic mean? It means trying to nurture a community of faith into total life offering. We're calling people into deep lives of worship. Now, worship, again, as a Presbyterian, sometimes worship really does get neatly boxed in to a thing that happens in a room with certain other things that are in the room. And if those things happen, worship happens. And if those things aren't there, then worship doesn't happen. And, you know, it's a very uh, predictably Presbyterian kind of box, with all due respect. Um, and, and there's really great high and holy versions of that, and there's some really just mechanized versions of that. And we all know that within our own traditions, whatever that might be, uh, whether we're Pentecostal or whether we're Baptist or whether we're Roman Catholic or Anglican, whatever it is that we might be. It just takes lots and lots of different shapes. But we are to call our people and nurture in our own lives a communion of worship. Like, that's the leading thing. The holistic transformation, then, is not about how do I get only certain liturgical words in my body. It's not about how do I think about certain religious forms. It's, it's that deep call to say, God really wants the whole of you and us. And God is calling us to a very peculiar life called a worship-centered life, which is not centered in the worship of Id idols, but centered in the worship of the one true and living God. That, that's just an astounding beginning point. And because God is not partial, he doesn't just want your mind, he doesn't want just your emotions, your gifts, your talents, your failures. God wants the whole of us. That's the beauty of the gospel. And it's the hope of the gospel. And it's exactly what God is going to persistently work out. The question is, is that what the church actually is seeking to mediate? Are we actually calling people? to holistic formation? Or are we thinking, oh gosh, it's enough to just get them to come on Sundays? When in fact, what we're really trying to do is, is lead and learn and love deeply so that people are invited to this whole picture of being part of God's new creation, a new imagination, a new heart, a larger capacity to love. Calvin uses the image that the school that church is really meant to be a schoolhouse. It's a practice center. It's a workout zone. It's a chance to be able to be come together as the people of God and work out in our inner communion the larger transformation that God wants to bring to the world. So how are we in our churches calling people to that deep transformation? This is so tricky because so churches are so prone to program out this deep work or to slice it in such a way that it feels like the slice is the whole work. When what we're trying to do is invite people into holistic, comprehensive transformation. One of the things I, uh, that drew me to the gospel was this sense that to be made new in Christ really meant the redoing of Mark Laverton. That that was really, I got to bring my whole self, warts and all, that was all part of the deal. But the long trajectory was that God is committed to remaking me in the image of Jesus Christ. And to do so not in an isolated, individualistic way, but as part of a community. And it's that combination, we'll come to that in just a minute, but the individual part of this transformation and the, and the congregational part that has to do with holistic formation means are we calling people deeply enough? 
are we calling people to, to, the, to the, a vigorous, real encounter with God and with God's people in whatever our setting may be? Frankly, this is partly where the black church has done so much to demonstrate to all the rest of us what holistic formation looks like. And I'm not claiming that the black church would say of itself uh, in all of its manifestations that it's the perfect icon of this. But what I see in the black church is a much more comprehensive vision of a whole person in a community in which all the reality of God is meant to meet all the reality of where we are as human beings. And in that work, that integrative work, that cultural work, that desperate work, that feeling that we're not just trying to be a little better, we're not just trying to get a few more people to come back to church, like that's completely missing the moment that we're in. This is a moment of are we calling people to first order things? And not as a high bar, meaning not trying to make it impossible as though, you know, only a few good, quote, men, unquote, but really to an authentic encounter. There's something in the dance of church leadership that can so easily remake the gospel around ourselves or around our leadership or around our programming or around our budget or around our buildings or around dot, 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 all kinds of things that can, that can take over. So how are we holding a holistic vision? And, and then how do we do it in a sustainable way? This is where the community is so critical. This work that we are describing is by no means something to be done individualistic. I can't just individualistically decide that I'm going to do these things or be these things. This is a work of being and doing, being and doing, being and doing constantly with one another in the context of real uh, love and joy, but also real pain and real suffering and real heartache. To me, the some of the very best moments, and it's not because uh, I have a macabre personality, but I am really moved by being with people in the course of conflict and in the context of death. Now, fortunately, pastoral ministry includes lots of joy and lots of creativity and lots of play and lots of laughter, and it's all of those things. But there's nothing like being able to be with people in the places of greatest pain. How's our pain doing? How's our pain capacity growing? How's our ability to lean into the reality of those things. I was taught more about how to pastor in pain by two women who I served alongside as pastors than I learned probably from anyone else. It was going with them in their pastoral care going, what did you just do? <laughs> Being pulled over by the authenticity and the persistence and the depth to which they were willing to go in actually asking the next question and the next question. So where are we as we calibrate our own ministry in relationship to whole formation? So much more about this to say. Heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. That's the formation that we're meant to give ourselves to. But the evangelical church, which has been the church that primarily Fuller as an institution has been oriented toward, has sometimes failed to really understand the other part of it, which is that it's not holistic formation only for the person but for the social reality in which we live, the communion, the people. And it's in the context of holistic formation on that side, which then means the church is meant to actually be a reflection of the richness of God's love and creativity and imagination, the richness of a world of diversity, the richness of people who are not like us, also together in one common communion because of Jesus Christ, who leads us into places of discovery that we would never even have known to taste or experience were it not for the privilege of that kind of communion. So the holistic formation that is holistic in the sense of comprehensive for the individual is true, but so is the holistic formation of saying, God is at work across peoples and tribes, tongues and nations, ethnicities, races, generations, contexts, locales, places of pain and places of suffering and places of beauty and places of celebration, all of which often go together. But in all of that work, are we also seeking holistic formation in the sense of wanting to be a church, a part of the body of Christ in its full richness? Now, again, sometimes this can be done in ways that feel anything but holistic. It feels like they can become very narrow and very, um, again, highly programmatized. Um, 
what I think we're instead wanting to do is is move toward a, a, a see and pray for a movement of the Holy Spirit that knits together the fractured body of Christ that we see in the United States today. There is great hostility. There, it's like facing real. Those are about real issues. They're about real hearts that are untransformed. They're about real places of pain and suffering out of which we have been formed and therefore react to other contexts with our formation in its strength and in its radical weakness. And in the context of all that, there is a work of grace that's meant to call us into this bigger picture of the church, a bigger, deeper picture. This is to put the, the vision then not on the context of how does my church, our church, become the church, but really, although amazingly, to be the church in a community is a pretty amazing thing. Um, but I don't think anybody else is in the community where you're the only uh, church. So what's amazing about that vision of God knitting us together is not about anything token. It's not about that. It's not about showing up with, quote, choir exchanges. It's, it's not about having just sort of some shared potlucks or something. It's not about something mechanical. It's about something deeply formative. It's how do we learn to walk into other people's lives and share other people's narratives. It's how do we come to inhabit the spaces of other people who are not like us. I have to say, over the years, one of the greatest gifts of becoming a Christian was the discovery that if I was to become a follower of Christ, it would rewrite my sociology. That it would put me in a different social location. That I would need to think about people that are both like me and unlike me in fundamental ways, like in a way that's like, this is my vocation. I am, I am knit together with people who don't come from the same background that I come from, that don't share a lot of the lived experience that I've had. And I, likewise, have not shared others unless together there is an opportunity to move deeply into that space. It was partly at Fuller as a student that uh, th initially through some international students and then through uh, both African-American and Latino students, especially at Fuller, that I felt like I was finally finding both my own comfort and my own readiness to move into unexpected places. I'd grown up in Washington State. My parents were very concerned that my brother and I grow up knowing Native Americans, the Yakima tribe is right there, and people who were only periodically in the Yakima Valley because of agriculture. So they, we did a lot as a family to try to be sure that we were not just growing up in a context that was, um, that was simply a, a white context. How do we actually form relationships? That had, that had been foundational to me. But it was while I was at Fuller, and then in the years since, uh, of walking deeper and deeper and deeper into the, into the lives of people who, whose social experience, whose birthright, whose family, whose economics, whose social reality has just not been my social reality. And the privilege of actually taking that on in so that it is not a thing there, but a thing here. My narrative, I couldn't tell you my narrative without telling the narrative of people who are deeply unlike me, whose pain and suffering is not my personal pain and suffering, but whose pain and suffering is now absolutely in me. I am not, I am not trying to be something over and against or even in distinction from them. I am not them and they are not me, but I am walking into spaces where now their formation is forming me. And I now see differently. I have different lenses on my eyes. I have a different way of seeing. I certainly don't see perfectly. I still have lots of work uh, to do on my inner ocular lenses. But my heart has been rewritten by the lives of people who are not like me. That has been part of my own personal holistic formation. Sometimes I'm in white settings when people will say to me, um, white people will say to me, uh, I would, it, it's embarrassing to even say it out loud. Um, um, you know, the phrase will be something like, um, it's nice that you're doing that kind of thing. <laughs> and I just can hardly breathe. Um, because it's not nice that I'm trying to do this. There's nothing nice about it. It's, it's, it's 
It's about being human. It's about being a disciple. It's about moving into spaces of unexpected transformation. It's about acknowledging all of my own biases. It's about acknowledging how much more I have to learn than I would ever be able to know on my own. And that is not a thing like a thing I'm doing, as though it's a project thing. It's not a project. It's a road of collective discipleship, a road of being deeply formed by people whose stories are not my story. And now some of those people have shared enough of their story that I feel like they, their story is absolutely written into my story in a way that I couldn't tell the story of my life without that. What is holistic formation? Whatever our manifestation of this is, and everybody in every congregation has to work this out, how do you learn to take risks? Formation happens in risk. Formation happens in pain. Formation happens in honesty. Formation happens in getting it wrong. Formation happens in forgiveness. It happens in a capacity to tell the truth and live in tension. Those are, those are just a few of the markers of what it takes to actually be transformed. There's no evidence in the Bible that people are ever transformed except in those kinds of terms, right? It never happens superficially. It's not like Jesus glues his life onto us. No. The blood of the cross, as it were, has to go all the way into us. And then it needs to transform us. And then as we take those steps, it almost always involves the things I just mentioned. It involves time, suffering, risk, pain, unexpected communion, getting it wrong, forgiveness, mercy. These are, this is the long road of holistic formation. And it creates a very different communion than sort of an organizational structure that just brings people together or a program. It's about a spiritual transformation. And that's what Ephesians says makes the church the leading apologetic that Jesus came, lived, died, and rose is us. So how are we doing? How are we doing in our own settings? How are we doing in our own personal lives? How are we doing in our communities? There's a lot of life and goodness and truth that's happening in your, in your lives and in your ministries. I celebrate that. And there is, for me, still an ongoing road. Moving back now to Oakland, uh, I'm eager to reconnect with <clears throat> various pastors and churches and friends in the Bay Area. But I'm also aware that I now have a different lens. Even in the 10 years that I've been, I've been at Fuller, my vision has continued to grow. I now see things in Oakland that I did not see before. I mean, I, I have a different social sensibility. I, I w deliberately walk on streets and drive in places to be able to see more of what Oakland actually is. Even though I, I would have said I did a lot of that, I still feel like I'm doing it a lot differently now than I would have been. And I have yet a distance to go. And as a pastor, one of the great joys is to both be earnestly in this road ourselves and then to invite other people to join us in this road. Mostly people who are, can become my teacher. Not meaning me only, but meaning people. We are meant to be a learning community where we can learn from one another. May we take the gifts that we've had and invite people into risk over time, in pain, <laughs> with honesty, with, oh, gosh, this is going to call for a real spiritual life. Actually, it does. <laughs> That's the thing. It calls for a real spiritual life to do these things. It's not a program. It's actually real spiritual life. Like going, this is really hard for me. I don't really feel like I have, I don't feel safe. I don't feel like I can get my bearings. Where's my voice? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things, right? And all of that is exactly the stuff that then becomes the grist that Jesus Christ uses to change and transform us. That's the place where the church should become more raw and less worried about itself. More willing to actually take a risk out into the spaces of where God, I think, is really moving. Mm -hmm. Using the gifts of God, the diversity of God's presence and power, no doubt about the reality and presence of Jesus Christ in the middle of all that. But as that is happening, and even as we might struggle and doubt about that as it's happening, it becomes the very thing that calls us on into still deeper waters. Now, I know, believe me, that sometimes getting people to just get to church is like a big deal. <laughs> so let it just be said. I get that. I get that the whole structure is conditional 
on people showing up and even more paying up. Because that's the kind of church we've created. But that's, with all due respect to the church, <laughs> that's not really exactly what we see in the pages of the New Testament. It's not built on a cost structure. It's not built on, on class. It's not built on money. It's not, it's not built on that. But the church we have is sort of built on all that. So in the crisis of this moment, we have to ask ourselves, how do we, you know, not try to throw out the baby with the bath, but neither be foiled into thinking that somehow something's not going to die if the church is going to actually live and thrive. I don't pretend to understand what that's going to be. I'm not, I'm not here as a soothsayer to uh, proclaim what I think the future church is going to look like, except I think it will be smaller, more intimate, and more local in the way that we heard referred to earlier. And with some exceptional expressions of that, which will gather large communities of people together, uh, gatherings of smaller communities together in one community for periodic large-scale worship, where the joy of the celebration of the festival is actually a huge part of our life together. Um, but, it's, but we live it side by side in a, in a much more intense communion. Mm -hmm.